um, depicting the big picture immune system, all of the different cells that are working together. And we talked last time about one way that we can subdivide the immune system to help us make sense of this whole mess, which is that we can subdivide into things like the barrier organs, the innate immune system, and the adaptive immune system. Today we're going to be talking about sort of some other types of, su of subdivisions. Um, today's lecture is really important, and I will tell you it's one of my least favorites. Um, because today we need to learn sort of the cast of characters here. We need to learn a little bit about a lot of these pieces. The goal is that I can start talking to you about individual parts in subsequent days, and you'll at least have heard of the things that I'm trying to connect them to. So, for example, I'm going to tell you about neutrophils today. You do not need to be the world's expert on neutrophils at the end of that discussion. We are going to hear more about neutrophils, and we're going to be applying neutrophil information in subsequent days. But you need to be ready if I tell you, and this is also interesting with neutrophils, to have a clue what neutrophils are. Um, and so today's really kind of the baseline, so where you get some vocabulary that we will be able to use later, but don't stress if you don't know every last detail about all of these cells, because that's what the rest of the semester is um, in that. Um, so as I mentioned, one way that we can subdivide the immune system is based on the barrier defenses, the innate immune response, and the adaptive immune response which we talked about last time. Um, in thinking about these types of immune responses, we can imagine some cells that are really important. Typically, we might talk about those as part of cellular immunity. We can talk about molecules that are really important. In this past, those molecules were talked about as part of humoral immunity. We can talk about organs that are really important. Um, and so we can also think about subdivisions of the that diversity of the immune system in that way. And that's what we're going to focus on today, is sort of what sort of these parts of the immune system are. Um, the thing that people studied early when studying the immune system was blood. And typically when people think about um, cells of the immune system, they think about blood cells. And so we can first try to think about what cells are found in the blood and how do we divide them up? Uh, blood cells that I even mentioned are blood cells. They're not really cells in the immune system. And one reason you might say is well, because they're part of the blood. So, duh. The other reason is because all of the cells that I have mentioned, all of the cells that we find in the blood, develop from the same stem cell. So red blood cells and white blood cells all started as the same kind of stem cell, which then differentiates further. Um, so originally there is a cell called the hematopoietic stem cell, or HSC, that basically goes through a number of different um, developmental stages in order to eventually make all of the cell types that we are going to talk about. This process of development of blood cells is known as hematopoiesis. Hema means blood, so that part makes sense. Poesis is a word that immunologists love to tack on. Poesis actually comes from the same Greek root as poetry. It means to make, so to make blood, hematopoiesis. Um, and anytime you read like a review article about hematopoiesis, it's always called the poetry of blood cells. Always. Um, so basically here we're making blood cells. If I wanted to make lymphocytes, I would call it lymphopoiesis. If I was going to make red blood cells, I'd call it lymphopoiesis. Uh, because they would, everybody loves to tack that on things. Um, so even our red blood cells come from these same stem cells, these same progenitors. Um, and so we often have to think a little bit about the red blood cells also because we're going to see them in so the first 
subtype of white blood cell that I want to tell you about um, are some cells that are grouped together here. So one thing that you can notice about them is that they all develop somewhat similarly. They're all bunched together in this developmental process. They're not separate. Not like over here, over here, over here. They're all bunched together. So they develop in a somewhat similar way. And they have a name. Um, their name is granulocytes. Here you can see images of the granulocytes from a microscope, as well as cartoons of those granulocytes. If you look at the granulocyte cartoons and the labeling of the granulocyte cartoons, there is one thing that granulocytes all have in common. What do you notice that granulocytes all have in common? Granules. In fact, granulocytes were named because they were the ones with the granules. Um, so all of these cells have these granules in them. Um, you can see kind of all of the spots when you look at the actual microscopy images, and you will see that more tomorrow. These granules are full of different compounds that the cells can secrete to do their job. One other thing that you might notice about granulocytes this is usually something we talk about with neutrophils, which are one of the types, but it's actually true of all of them. Um, in the dark purple, you can look at the neutrophil on the top, it's easiest to see it, although it's visible in all of them. Dark purple is the nucleus. Look at the nucleus of that neutrophil. What does it look like? <clears throat> yeah, it's like there's two of them. Like there's two of them, or like it's in clumps, like it's not just like a nice circular nucleus like you would expect. And so granulocytes tend to have a low nuclei um, as well. Um, sometimes they are referred to as PMNs. Or polymorphic. When you are looking under the microscope for neutrophils tomorrow, many lobes or many parts, many parts, polymorpho, will be the key thing that you're going to look for when you're looking at neutrophils tomorrow. So these cells have unique structures. There are three major types of granulocytes. One of them is the neutrophil, one of them is the eosinophil. One of them is the basophil. Um, these are distinguished based on the way that they stain with a particular staining procedure. Um, neutrophils seem to have granules that were neutral in pH. Neutrophils. Um, and thus, they didn't pick up a particularly acidic or basic dye. Eosinophils versus basophils. Basophils like base. Eosinophils took up a dye called eosin. Um, so it, they're classified based on sort of what's in the granules or old tiny what staining they did. But that's based on what's in the granules. Um, we can also tell one other thing about um, some of our granulocytes uh, from this slide and this cartoon. If you look at the neutrophil cartoon, you will see a few parts labeled. One of the parts of the neutrophil that is labeled is an organelle known as a phagosome. A phagosome is an organelle that's uh, formed during phagocytosis. And so the fact that neutrophils have phagosomes tells you that neutrophils do phagocytosis. Um, you guys sometimes learn about that as a cell biology concept, you learn about phagocytosis. In fact, only four kinds of cells in your whole body know how to do phagocytosis. The neutrophils have the phagosomes, so you can start to see phagocytosis most of the time from the neutrophils. Um, if we look at the granulocytes here, um, I will sort of find this thinking about.
about granulocyte data on this a little funny. So the first thing we can look at are the neutrophil data. And what you can notice is of all of the cells that we see here, of all of the white blood cells, neutrophils are a lot more. They're something times 10 to the 3, whereas everybody else is times 10 to the 2. There's way more neutrophils than they are of any of these other cell types. They are between 50 and 70 percent of um, white blood cells. So neutrophils are your most frequent white blood cells. You have a lot of them. Um, eosinophils and basophils are your rarest white blood cells. Um, in fact, tomorrow when you're going to look for eosinophils and basophils, it will be a challenge. Um, and I'm going to say that's a good thing because, you know, you have like four. And it would be sad if you lost one to even slide instead of stuff that you get to, you know, recently. Because um, you have so few. So they're very, very rare. So usually when we think about granulocytes, we're kind of thinking about mm -hmm. neutrophils because there's tons of neutrophils and there's like no eosinophils and basophils. Um, you will notice also that neutrophils have the super short half-life. They give us a half-life for eosinophils and basophils, but I don't totally believe it because we know very little about them because there's like four. Um, and it's really hard to study them because they are such rare cells. Um, so usually the most important cells that we find um, when, we, when we think about when we think about granulocytes are really neutrophil cells. Um, the number of neutrophils that you find in your blood does vary quite a bit. You go to the doctor and you get a white blood cell count to see if you're sick. Really what they're looking at is your neutrophil numbers. Neutrophils are not always found in the blood. You hold a lot of neutrophils in the bone marrow and if you get sick, your body releases those neutrophils to try to fight the infection. And so if you have a super big number of neutrophils in your blood, that means you're probably having an infection. And so when you go to the doctor and get a white blood cell count, this is really what they're looking for, is that neutrophil weakness. Um, there is one other cell type that is important that is related to granulocytes. Um, so one thing that gets a little weird here is that we often think about immune cells as being cells that are in the blood. There are many immune cells, however, that don't always hang out in the blood. Blood is not the best place for some of these things. They might live in tissues instead of in the blood. So there is a cell type that's related to granulocytes that is not found in blood, that's found in tissues instead. That cell type is called a mast cell. You can see that mast cells have super big lots of granules. The only difference between mast cell and any of our other granulocytes is that mast cells don't live in the blood. They tend to live in tissues. Um, there are many people who think that basophils are actually like pre-mast cells, and they grow up to become mast cells later in their life. But again, that basophils are so rare that it's very hard to actually demonstrate that. So some people think that beta cells are just not yet grown up mast cells. Um, mast cells uh, are full of all these granules and can become triggered to release those granules. And so you can see this is a rat mast cell before, this is a mast cell after, where it has basically released all those granules. And those granules are full of things like histamine and all the things that make you feel like crap when you have allergies. So usually in April, I really hate mast cells. Okay, mass cell load cause all of my life problems. <laughs> um, so that's what these cells are. Yeah? Sorry. Is there like an evolutionary advantage to why we have so many more neutrophils than the other cells? Probably. And it probably has to do largely because of neutrophils' ability to do phagocytosis. And so as we start to talk, it'll be next week that we'll really get more into the, like, a lot of nitty gritty details about neutrophils. But I often think of neutrophils as kind of being the SWAT team. That come in and do phagocytosis and keep bacterial numbers down in order to make sure they don't out-replicate us. 
And so we need those fast SWAT team Pac-Man cells to just come in and keep uh, things sort of cleaned up. Is, is the short answer to that. Um, past granulocytes, <coughs> there are some other types of immune cells. One of those cells is known as the monocyte. Um, monocytes are closely related to another type of cell called a macrophage. Mono means one. And so originally monocytes were named because they didn't have the same janky nucleus that the neutrophils did. They, only, they didn't have a million lobes. They didn't have poly morphonuclear things. They had one clump of nucleus, although it looked like a kidney. And so the fact, so kidney bean shaped nucleus is actually a distinguishing feature of a monocyte. Monocytes tend to live in the blood. Um, you will notice monocytes also have a phagosome, so they're probably going to be another of our phagocytic cells. And spoiler alert, they are. Um, monocytes can also grow up and live in tissues. And when they do that, they're called macrophages instead of monocytes. So officially, the monocyte is the version that lives in the blood. A macrophage is a slightly more differentiated version that lives in tissue. They're largely the same. I tend to use the words monocytes and macrophages interchangeably. And I am perfectly happy with you using the words monocytes and macrophages interchangeably. Um, if I ever, by mistake, I try not to do this stuff, but sometimes it's hard. If you ever see me write something like this, M5, that is immunologist shorthand for macrophage. So that's pretty typical for what immunologists are immunologist writing quickly and they want to write macrophage, you write M5. So if I write it on board or something, that's what that means. Um, so one thing also for you to know about um, macrophages is you might have heard of them before and not known it. Because macrophages, as I said, live in tissues. And once upon a time, people were doing pathology. They were studying different parts of the human body under a microscope. And they saw different kinds of cells, and they gave them names. That's what you do. And they didn't all know they were looking at macrophages. So in fact, historically, different kinds of macrophages have had different names. We can just call them macrophages. I don't care, but I want, on the next slide, it tells you some of the other names people have used for macrophages. So the point here is more if you've learned about one of these other cell types in another context, you can be like, oh, that's just a macrophage. It's just a fancy name for a macrophage. Um, so the one that you've most likely heard of is microglia, which are cells in the brain. Microglia are just brain macrophages. You may have heard of alveolar macrophages. You may have heard of Kupfer cells. Um, you may have heard of Langerhans cells. Um, so you can see that there are special, there are macrophages that live in many tissues. They have physiologic relevance in those tissues. So for example, those microglia, those macrophages that do phagocytosis in the brain, are actually really important for proper neural circuit development. They have to get rid, they basically get rid of the extra stuff so that your brain can work. Um, some people actually think that part of the reason why sleep is important is so that microglia have time to clean up the debris in your brain. Um, so macrophages are actually really cool. So um, all of these things, as far as I'm concerned, are just nice. Um, but people who work on other anatomical systems, obviously, um, will spend more time thinking about them as their own important subtype. There is one other type of cell that is related to um, the monocyte and macrophage, and that is a cell that's known as a dendritic cell. Dendritic cells are a little tricky. We're not going to hear a ton about dendritic cells again until relatively far into the semester. But dendritic cells can also come from monocytes. So some monocytes grow up and become macrophages. Other monocytes grow up and become dendritic cells. Um, at this point, You have 
scene. Neutrophils. Basophils. Eosinophils. Monocytes. <laughs> and macrophages. Before I show you. Turns out that this list of cells is also the list of cells that are the innate immune system. Dendritic cells are this weird bridge. They're innate immune cells, but their job has to do with adaptive immunity. So they sort of straddle the line between innate and adaptive immunity. And that's why we're not going to talk about them in a lot of detail until later. And so, sort of innate, but key for adaptive, <laughs> or on the bridge, or whatever else you want to call it, is where the dendritic cell block is. And so that kind of makes it a little bit different than most of the other cell types that we've talked about. Here you can see again that same kind of table. And you will notice our same list of cells that I just mentioned to you. They are largely the cells of, they are the cells of the innate immune system. And sometimes they are also known as myeloid cells. So if you group the granulocytes and the monocytes together, um, that is also sometimes referred to as myeloid cells. Um, and one of the reasons why I mentioned that is because when I was proofreading lab one last night, I had written myeloid cells because I thought defined it. Um, so I, read, I defined it now, but also that's what it means. Um, so those are really the cells that make up the innate immune system. So our two are dividing up by cells and are dividing up by uh, layers kind of go together. The other group of cells besides granulocytes and monocytes are this group of cells known as lymphocytes. If you look at lymphocytes under a microscope, they look relatively similar in that they have a pretty big nucleus, relatively little cytoplasm. There are some that will have a little more cytoplasm, but you can see this nice circular nucleus. Um, so there are a few different types of lymphocytes that you might see under a scope, but we generally refer to them all as lymphocytes. We can subdivide lymphocytes a lot. And so there are tons of types of lymphocytes. Um, sometimes I think we're getting a little bit ridiculous with our types of lymphocytes, that we have like lymphocytes that respond to fungi in your pee, -pee on Tuesday. Like, there's like, some of the subdivisions are getting a little much. Um, but we can actually subdivide a lot of different categories of lymphocytes. Um, they all still are lymphocytes. And your lymphocytes are, in fact, the cells that make up your adaptive immune system. So all of these guys are your innate immune system. Your adaptive immune system is made up of lymphocytes. Um, sometimes we refer to these guys as the lymphoid cells. And all these guys are the myeloid cells. If you think about it, when you understand some things about the immune system, when you ask your uh, friends about the immune system, think about what people know about it. Most of what people know is about the adaptive immune system. I told you last time that the adaptive is the one that most people think is most interesting. You can go through the syllabus and look at how many lectures I devote to innate versus how many lectures I devote to adaptive. But one thing that I do want to point out to you is that lymphocytes are actually you know, way less frequent than So there are many, many, many cells in the immune system. There are relatively fewer lymphocytes. Um, and so they're probably 
real strong. Because you don't need as many of them to do a good job. I know you said that the gridic cells kind of bridge the gap between mm -hmm. innate and um, adaptive immunity, yep. but would dendritic cells count as myelite cells because they're modified derived? Dendritic cells are myelite cells, yes. yes. Um, that's the simple answer to that question. There's a complicated answer to it, but that's the simple answer. Um, so we can think about the immune system as a collection of all of these kinds of cells. We can also think about the immune system as a group of organs. So there are also a bunch of organs that are really important to the immune system. Um, there's a lot of them. They're labeled here. And just like with the whole long list of cells, we can divide up the organs in specific ways as well. So when we think about organs of the immune system, we can divide them into primary, secondary, Um, primary lymphoid organs um, are on this slide in red, and they are on this slide in blue. Um, so there are only two primary lymphoid organs. The two are the thymus and the bone marrow. The bone marrow is important stuff inside of your bones. The thymus is an additional organ. It sits on top of the heart. Um, it is not the thyroid, which is higher. People love to confuse those. Thymus, thyroid, thymus, thyroid, thymus, thyroid. Um, I'll show them to you in the second lab in a mouse. You can see the difference between them. Um, so these are our two primary lymphoid organs. Primary lymphoid organs have an important job. Pri primary lymphoid organs are the places where white blood cells develop. So this is where hematopoiesis occurs. All of those stem cells I told you about before come from the bone marrow and do some developmental steps in the bone marrow. One type of lymphocyte, the T cell, needs a little extra help. We can imagine the T cell is having to go to college after. Um, everybody else is done when they're out of the bone marrow and the T cell needs more work. The T cell does its extra developmental steps in the thymus. Um, the structure of both the thymus and the bone marrow is super important in having like a lot of cells that support the development of all of the other cells there. So there are all sorts of cells that are really important in like, developmental support and their structures and things like that that are really important to make development happen. But that's the goal of the primary cell. Um, this process of hematopoiesis, as I said, is happening in the primary lymphoid organ. Um, specifically in the bone marrow, once you are born, you do do a little bit of hematopoiesis in other organs before birth, um, like yolk sac, fetal liver, and spleen. You can see that here um, laid out in both the human and the mouse. But by the time you're born, all of your hematopoiesis is happening. Um, so first of all, notice you did some hematopoiesis before you were born. Also notice that you keep doing hematopoiesis throughout your life. So next time you are um, you know, feeling lazy and your mom yells at you and is like, do something. And you're like, I'm doing medical research. Yeah. Um, because in fact, you are doing white blood cell development at all times. The next really key type of lymphoid organs are the secondary lymphoid organs. Really um, we have a lot of secondary lymphoid organs. To understand secondary lymphoid organs and really how they work, we've got to take a little diversion to talk about the circulatory system. This is an immunologist's view of the circulatory system. It's actually not complete because I should draw a heart. That's the circulatory system as far as an immunologist is concerned. And there's one key thing we got to know about the circulatory system. So the heart is a super big pump. Think really strong. Yeah. Okay, let's imagine that I take a garden hose and I hook it on to, or I take a fire hose, hook it on to a fire hydrant, and I turn on that fire hydrant full blast. Okay? Now let's imagine 
that I walk up to that fire hose and I squeeze it and decrease its diameter. What is going to happen? This bridge must break. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Pressure's going to Pressure's gonna go up. And what could be the result of the pressure going up? Yes, Molly. Huh? Burst of cells. Explosion. We can have explosion. We can also have um, potentially uh, like a backup and like a big bubble forming. <laughs> but you can imagine, that would be bad. Well, look at the circulatory system. We have this gigantic pump starts pumping things through a tube with a big diameter, and then the diameter gets smaller. You may not realize this, but you have not exploded. <laughs> you are still intact. So clearly, there is a way around this explosion problem. The explosion problem is true physics. Two-fold change in diameter gives us a 16-fold change in flow. We can do the equations. And so, in fact, your blood vessels are made in a special way. This is specifically true of the arteries. Your arteries have permeable walls. And to get rid of that pressure increase, your arteries let out water. So you've got blood that is water and cells here at the beginning and as we go further into the circulatory system the water is pushed out so that by the end when we get to the capillaries you might hear people say the capillaries are so small that only one cell can get through it yeah and it's actually only the cells left everything else has been pushed out because to equalize the pressure so this is pretty awesome it gets rid of our pressure problem now we are not exploding but if you really think about it, it gives us another problem. You think about your blood going through your circulatory system, all the water being pushed out of your vessels. How is it that you are not Jabba the Hutt? Right? You should just be a blob of water. How does the water get, how do you get it back and not just have it everywhere? Um, we, we, evolution plan for this. Evolution dealt with this problem. And so you have an additional part of your circulatory system that is designed to collect the water. This is known as the lymphatic system. The lymphatic system is this additional system of vessels throughout your body. There's no pump connected here. These vessels all have open ends. So water just goes in them. They also have valves, so liquid can only flow one way. It can't flow backwards and come back out. And so the idea is you have all of these vessels around your body collecting that water, coming together, branching back together, and eventually um, dumping back in via the thoracic duct into your bloodstream. Um, as I said, there's no pulp. So how do we force the liquid to move the direction we want it to move? We do this. So in fact, body movement is what's pushing liquid into um, the lymphatics. So the lymphatic system is really about this dealing with this water problem. But in fact, evolution was smart about this. And not only do we have this nice water collection system, but at some point, places throughout this system, there are surveillance centers. Because if there are, if we're collecting water and liquids and proteins that are outside of ourselves, turns out we're also probably going to collect all the bacteria and viruses and any other type of pathogen. And so we have basically little stations where we're able to check for pathogens throughout this water collection system. Those are the lymph nodes. And so the idea here is that cells, bacteria, proteins, water, et cetera, all get pushed into these open vessels. They come together in different branches, and eventually they run into a lymph node where we can do some surveillance. Your entire body is studded with lymph nodes throughout. So you've got lymph nodes 
um, sort of everywhere throughout the body, there are specific ones that are important for surveillance of different anatomic locations. So for example, if you have sort of a, an infection in your head or in your sinus cavity, the lymph nodes right here are the ones that are going to do the surveillance. The water from here is draining down into these lymph nodes before going back to the heart. And that's where um, we're going to have that surveillance happen. So these are officially known as the draining lymph nodes that drain this part of your body. The lymph node that drains your leg is behind your knee, the, the bottom part of your leg. So the drain, the top part of your leg is in your groin. You've got lymph nodes in your armpits. You've got lymph nodes all over. You're going to see lymph nodes in your arms as well. And so we've got all sorts of lymph nodes. Um, if you have some infection site, it will eventually get picked up in the nearest draining lymph node um, while the lymph is being collected and brought back into the thoracic duct. Um, and so you can see that whole process happening here as well. You've got the heart, blood and cells come out of the artery, stuff ends up in the lymph node. Eventually we have things travel back to the lymphatics and get dumped back into the bloodstream right before the heart at the thoracic duct. And you can see that happening here as well. You've got, um, this is the thoracic duct, um, the lymphatics dumping things back into the heart, and here's heart, here's blood and arteries moving things to go back and forth to the heart to get the actual root or not. Um, so this is sort of the general idea of lymphocyte recirculation, and those lymph nodes are the secondary lymphoid organs. Your secondary lymphoid organs are these surveillance centers that are placed around your body, and they are actually where immune responses start, where immune responses initiate. You could also think of them as where your, your cells, particularly your adaptive immune cells, your lymphocytes, where they meet pathogens. Sometimes people refer to them as the dance hall uh, of the immune system, or I have also heard them referred to as where the party happens. So the secondary lymphoid organ is where we start the, the immune response. It's where all of our particularly B cells and T cells are going to find antigen. And this makes a lot of sense. If you are the T cell for flu, one option you might have is you might go through the whole body. And you might first go to this cell and be like, do you have flu? And then do you have flu? Do you have flu? Do you have flu? And go around the whole body. That would take a long time and not be very productive. And you know, then flu might come in while you're not even through all the cells. Alternatively, these cells just have to look at the lymph nodes. They just have to make the circuit of the lymph nodes and see, does your area of the body have a problem? Does your area of the body have a problem? Does your area of the body have a problem? And so this regional specification really helps to make the immune response more efficient. Um, lymph nodes are the major secondary lymphoid organs. Um, they have lymph vessels coming in and lymph vessels going out. They also have blood vessels coming in and blood vessels coming out. And they have a lot of different organized areas in them where different types of cells will live, um, where uh, antigens will come, where different types of cells are going to be. You can actually see them under the microscope pretty easily and see, and I, you can actually pick out all of these different areas really easily. The other really famous secondary lymphoid organ is the spleen. As far as I'm concerned, the spleen is just a big lymph node. The spleen has all of those same areas. If you can see here, we've got some B cells going through, we've got some T cells going through, all of those areas. But it's surrounded by an additional thing called the red pulp, which is what filters your red blood cells. It gets rid of damaged red blood cells. So the spleen is basically a big lymph node that also plays a role in red blood cell biology. And while, say, the lymph node behind your knee is the lymph node that drains the bottom part of your leg, your spleen is basically the lymph node that checks the blood. Um, but again, as far as most immunologists are concerned, concern, spleen is lymph nodes in a lot of ways. Um, we also have some other organized tissue in the body that can act as secondary lymphoid tissue. One very important set of that tissue is known as the GALT. GALT stands for gastrointestinal 
associated lymphoid tissue. I sure can. It is gastrointestinal. Um, one thing you'll notice about this semester is that immunologists love acronyms, and I think it's super important to know what they stand for, because half the time if you know what they stand for, you don't have to memorize anything else. As long as you know what it stands for, then you're like, oh, that's obvious. So it's gastrointestinal associated lymphoid tissue. Basically, this is tissue that has some of the same organization as a lymph node, but isn't kind of as a full developed lymph node. It's just like a little piece of tissue that has some similarities. Um, there is a lot of gastrointestinal associated lymphoid tissue. There are some estimates um, that very, lar very large percentages of your immune system is in the GALT. Um, honestly, I think that most of the studies people have done of that are a little sketchy. And so I won't even quote you the number because I believe the number goes from 20 to 95. Um, so <laughs> the answer is a lot, and it's hard to study. Um, so one thing you can see, for example, is that next to the villi in your intestines, there are these little spots of lymphoid tissue. Here you can see the villi, and actually these big areas sort of between them that are all organized like a lymph node that let you do surveillance of the contents of your intestine. Um, they are usually referred to as Peyer's patches, and so you can see these nice white bumps on the intestine of this mouse. Um, and so the Peyer's patches are one of the most famous forms of gastrointestinal associated with the results. And you will see the Peyer's patches uh, when we do mouse dissection. Um, so this is one big type of uh, lymphoid tissue. Officially, the appendix is also part of GALT. So sometimes people are like, what does the appendix do? The appendix is actually a uh, GALT. Um, we also do have an, some other similar types of organized tissue that doesn't get to be like doesn't fully qualify as a lymph node, but it's sort of tissue that's organized in a similar way. Um, in other areas, um, sometimes it's thought about as being mucosal. Sometimes it's thought about as being weasel. And sometimes it's thought about as being bronchioalveolar. That's hard. associated lymphoid tissue, it's known as malt. If it's nasal associated lymphoid tissue, it's known as malt. If it's bronchioalveolar associated lymphoid tissue, it's known as malt. Um, and so we can see um, a number of these different things. Some places in the respiratory tract, also things like the adenoids and the tonsils, um, all as additional sort of surveillance centers in different parts of the body. So all of those are the big secondary lymphoid tissue. As I said, the secondary lymphoid tissue is largely where um, our immune cells interact with one another. As I said, it's where the party happens. Um, so there's typically, so we're kind of thinking about like immune anatomy here. And oftentimes when people think about different types of anatomy, they think of it as pretty old school and boring. Like, oh my gosh, we've known organs of bodies since like, And you know, you can use an old dusty anatomy book and get the same information you get now. And so that's often the way people think about a lot of these immune organs. About two years ago, I was super excited to present to the class that we had actually found a new set of lymphatics. Um, so this is from um, summer 2015. We used to think that the lymphatic system actually ended here in your head. And we have since figured out that, that you actually have a full set of lymphatics going all the way up and through the brain. Um, and so we just recently found this great set of additional lymphatics that's connecting the brain within the past three years. Um, so this might uh, make some of you think it's really funny. Uh, so if you, any of you guys have done any lab work with Dr. Wolf, sometimes you will do dissections of brain. 
And one thing you'll do is you'll take this part called the meninges, it's like the covering of the brain, and you'll take it off and you'll throw it away. Because it's going to make your brain so it'll be bad for your cells. Yeah, it turns out it's not so bad. This is called the meninges. <laughs> um, and that's actually the, uh, the organized lymphatics of the brain, which um, um, is exactly what they're going to take dissect right off. Um, so this is very much a new and exciting field. And then last year, um, people got excited again uh, last fall because they were like, oh my gosh, we found a new organ. Um, it's called the mesentery. It's actually connective tissue around your intestine. Um, and it's full of lymph nodes, known as the mesenteric lymph nodes. Um, I thought this was particularly hilarious because ever since, I don't know, 2003, four, um, when I started doing mouse dissections, I would take mesenteric lymph nodes and dissect out the mesentery. So I know what this is. I don't know how CNN did this. <laughs> but apparently, um, in uh, the winter of 2017, scientists were very excited to discover this new organ, which I will show you when we dissect out the mesentery in the next video. I don't know how they did it. It's really obvious. <laughs> I, I don't know what they're thinking is a thing. It's always been a thing. Um, so that's really cool. Um, and then last week, um, we found another new organ. organ. Um, so this is uh, the actual paper. Um, but in fact, if you if you Google subcapsular proliferative foci, which is the name of this new structure, you will find lots of things like this that say newly identified structure in lymph nodes hiding in plain sight, or scientists found the part of the immune system that controls vaccines, which I believe the title of one of these articles is. Um, and what we realize is that there's actually a new section in lymph nodes that seems to be important for all memory adaptive immune responses. Um, we, we tend to, when we look at um, lymph nodes, to do cuts up and down through them to see different parts of it. And it turns out that there's a layer across the top that we've always been cutting through. Because we don't cut this direction, we always cut this direction, but we never know again. Um, and so by doing this new, really cool microscopy, this is actually a reconstruction of microscopy of showing that layer and being able to see this. And so um, while people often think about you know, a list of the important organs of some aspect of the body as being you know, a pretty stable list, as being sort of very old school science, in fact, we are still finding some of these new organs. Um, some of you may know that I think that some aspects of immunology in bats is a cool thing to look. And we don't even, we can't even find some of their organs. You know, they have the cells, but we can't figure out what they look like um, in a lot of cases. So there's a lot to be done with this, even in sort of the simple, like, what is the list of organs check in the tree material. And you will see that throughout the semester. Every day, we're going to come across something where you're going to ask a question, and I'm going to be like, that's something that people are currently studying, and we don't know the answer to that. So that's a great part about immunology and sort of So at this point, I have told you about primary lymphoid organs. And primary lymphoid organs are where we start the response. I told you about secondary, or sorry, primary lymphoid organs are where we do development of cells. Secondary lymphoid organs are where we actually start the response, where the um, cell meets up with the pathogen. So then we have one final type of lymphoid organ. And that final type of lymphoid organ is the tertiary lymphoid organ. Tertiary lymphoid organs are places where you have an immune response. So after cells of the immune system get activated in the secondary lymphoid organ, they go to the place where we're going to have a response, that tertiary lymphoid organ. So another way you could phrase that is that a tertiary lymphoid organ is a place where you get infected, or it's a site of infection. So I've been able to list for you the primary lymphoid organs, the bone marrow and the thymus. I've been able to list the secondary lymphoid organs, the lymph nodes, the spleen, Peyer's patches, uh, tonsils, all that kind of stuff. Let's think about listing tertiary lymphoid organs. What are tertiary lymphoid organs? Yes, Marina? All of you. All of you. Every part 
of your body could be infected. And so every part of your body can be a tertiary lymphoid organ um, in specific location uh, situations. So basically the tertiary lymphoid organ is whatever part of you is infected at this time. So today if you have a rash, the skin is a tertiary lymphoid organ. If on a different day you have hepatitis, the liver is a tertiary lymphoid organ. Whatever is sort of the infected part right now is the tertiary lymphoid organ. Anything can be a tertiary lymphoid organ. And anything has the ability to make kind of that base of the response because any part of your body can be infected. So um, those are kind of the players that we have here. The next step of this is, first of all, in lab tomorrow, where we get to actually see these players under a microscope and start working with them. And so a big part of the lab, or one of the many reasons why we do this lab, is so you can get a lot more comfortable with these cells. And you will know all these cells backwards and forwards and who's who by the end of lab because you'll have been spending so much time with them. Um, but now we are actually going to start getting into the details of how this works, specifically with the innate immune response. But again, we're going to worry about subdividing. So when we do the innate immune response, we are going to subdivide it into proteins that do something and then cells that do something. So we're going to sort of, again, have a subdivision of all the things that we're seeing. Um, and Friday, we will start with those 